Welcome, everyone, to our first panel of the day here at the Panagora Pharma CX Tech Summit. Uh, this panel is focused on emerging technology in the pharma space. And we have four excellent panelists to join the conversation with us. We have Mary Lasseter from Sanofi. We have Kristen Winters from Bayer, Michael De Palma from Pensare, and Ahmad from Medulin. Or is it Medulan? No, it's Medulan. You Medulan. got it right. Okay, I got it right. Uh, so you guys can introduce yourselves a little bit further. And if you have a disclaimer, please say it now. I'll also put one up on the screen. However, um, you can feel free to say it now, and then we'll jump right into the discussion. Mary? All right. Hi, I'm Mary from Santa Fe, and I do have a disclaimer. So the views and opinions are that of the individual presenter and should not be attributed with any company of which they are employed. So thank that, you so much, Matt. That is a good one. Kristen. Yep, Kristen Winters. Um, I'm customer experience lead at Bayer. Um, and I would just say, I'll just ditto what Mary said because my disclaimer would be exactly the same. So that's good. <laughs> Michael. Hi guys, uh, Michael, real quick introduction, uh, scientist by education, technologist by vocation, 20 years in the industry, and my, my disclaimer is anything I say, I mean. So. <laughs> <laughs> Ahmed? Ahmed Albeiti, I'm CEO and Managing Partner at Medulin, uh, and these days I focus a lot on digital strategy and being responsive to uh, our environment for the last several months. So I have been uh, working with people all over the world, responding to what we're, we're trying to do here, uh, and I do not have any disclaimers at this time. Good enough, good <laughs> enough. So you guys all come from different backgrounds, roles, responsibilities, etc., cetera, but um, you know, specifically for what you're looking at right now, who is your customer, Mary? That's a great question, Seth. So um, as a campaign management lead at Santa Fe, I actually have two customers. So we have our external customers, which are our normal HCPs, healthcare practitioners, and patients and uh, caregivers. But we also have internal customers as part of a global team to make sure that as we deploy our systems, we have brand teams, we have marketing teams, we have country lead teams that we all work with internally. So you're looking at both inside and outside yep both. which is a very good perspective how about you Ahmad? well um i'd say we have so many customers that i kind of put them in two buckets um uh customers whose whose success is tied to your success and that usually comes with some amount of viability financial or, or otherwise and then customers that that make a systemic difference you know, so whatever you do, they, they have something to benefit and it's, you know, people call them stakeholders, etc. So I, I espouse to being customer centric and human centric and there's an intersection. I don't think the two are the same thing all the time. Michael? I think the answer is yes, right? So uh, the answer is just about everybody. So on the sell side, you've got, you know, folks like Mary and Kristen and whatnot. Obviously, I've dealt with you guys and, and, and folks like you on the brand side and on the pharma side for years. Um, Pharma itself has this sort of surrogacy of customer, right? So who are your customers? Physicians, healthcare providers, who are their customers, patients, ultimately. Um, but then on the other side, it's everyone who hopes to influence and work with organizations like yourself. So agencies, technology partners, AI partners, platform partners, et cetera. So the answer is all of these groups have some level of influence on the ultimate customer, which is going to be a patient or a subject. Kristen? Yeah, I mean, I would say my answer is similar to Mary in that it's, you know, HCPs, patients, big customers, key customers that we service with as well, providers. But I think, um, you know, internally, we're always trying to put ourselves in other people's shoes to try to figure out what it is that would be able to get the job done well. So whether it's internally, we're working on something or if it's going to be promotion, you just want to address it in a way that makes sense for them, that person. Gotcha. So now we've got a kind of a baseline on who your customers are and shared a little bit about your philosophy about customer experience. So in, in terms of improving CX, what technology or tool do you feel is the most impactful today and why? Mary? So as far as when it comes down to a tool, I really think it's about how you set up your teams and your technology. Um, so you can make that customer experience seamless. So really, like if you think about it, like if we go to a car dealership, 
they know when we need to get our oil changed, right? So it's a seamless, timeless manner that's all relevant and pulled kind of together. So when you look at that experience, you're pulling all the data together to figure out who that customer is and being able to offer that next best action of what they need to be able to do. So really it's behind the scenes. How do you offer a seamless experience to the ultimate customer, but how do you have the teams work together to ultimately deliver that and can they do it efficiently? So it's really um, kind of twofold, like the data, the technology, and the teams of how you all work together. So it's not a, a patient or HCP facing piece of technology or platform. It's what you're doing on the back end that counts. What do you think, Michael? Um, I would agree with that. Uh, I think that the most important word there is this, this concept of friction, right? The, the best experiences are those that are frictionless or near frictionless. And if you think about all of the best experiences you've had, and the worst experiences you've had in any sort of area of life, you'll see that concept of friction, right? Nobody likes to go to the MV. Why? I got to wait in line. I got to fill out forms and triple get. There's, there's this whole sort of old level of experience. Um, and the best experiences are those that are near frictionless, the ones that meet us where we are. Um, hence the advent of, of, you know, the use of technology. Why do we use mobile so much? It's where people are. Um, why do we use, you know, uh, um, AI and ML, because it's easier for us to enter, engage with patients and for them to engage with us. So uh, I think that broadly speaking, and this, this transcends pharma, but anywhere we can use technology to create a frictionless experience or a near frictionless experience where people are is the, is the best approach. Kristen, is this creating any friction with your philosophy? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm nodding yes in agreement because I think, you know, um, as I, I mentioned at the start, you know, where, where you can see things happening real time and that instantaneous gratification of uh, the data I just inputted is giving me something back that's valuable. I think that's the ultimate goal, you know, and I think we have a ways to go in pharma, but I think that that's what we ultimately all want to achieve is that ability to, you know, meet the customer's goal or meet the customer's needs when they most need it at that moment. And so... No one has really pinpointed or identified any type of, of technology or, or platform or tool. So <laughs> I'll go over to Ahmed and say, uh, you can go ahead and toot your own horn. Does Medulin have anything uh, that is impacting CX? And you don't have to be shy about that because I'm sure yeah. that it does uh, relate to the greater CX I think, experience. I think the, the, the very truthful answer is most of the technologies that are having the most impacts are the same ones we've had for a while. Uh, uh, smartphone connectivity, uh, visualization, computing, cloud, these are not new. I think the, um, the, the, the reason they're having more impact now is one, we're all forced to operate differently. We, we, we were chatting before this, the show started, and that's really has, has pushed the limits on everything that can be done, the capacity of those technologies has been brought to bear, finally, that has always been there. And that's having a huge impact. So it wasn't one, any one isolated invention. And then the, the thing that I think will make the most difference is in two areas. One is, is just technologies that bring tech other, these technologies together in meaningful ways, the way Michael talked about it. That orchestration of, of service experience only happens when there are combinations of things working in harmony. So technologies in that category are gonna be very effective. And I think the technologies with the most promise are assistant, uh, digital assistant technologies have the most promise. They haven't been really fully utilized yet. The irony is that they, they're technologies that want to be human. And I think that's why they're, they're sort of poised to take over uh, from SMSs and other things where we're connecting humans. You're not going to be able to connect to a machine. And I think that's a fundamentally different type of consumer experience. And I think that's going to change everything you do today in 10 years will be in some way touched by an assistant. I see. So you're actually saying that we need technology to bring technology together. That's like scheduling a meeting in order to schedule yeah. a meeting, right? In a way. Or uh, <laughs> well, having it, a meeting to discuss your next meeting. Exactly. <laughs> but, it, but, it, but it is very true because you have all these disparate things that people have been working on and improving for the last five, 10 years. And, you know, how can we get them all unified and how can we get yeah. them all uh, harmonized in the, in the same place? In it's fact, serious. we used to call this conference, uh, you know, mobile biz tech. Um, but that was, you know, four or five years ago, uh, we, we had to adapt uh, <laughs> with, with the times. So with relation to technology and customer experience, where can pharma improve? 
I know we've talked about seamlessness, frictionlessness, but is there anywhere specifically that, uh, you know, we're not doing our best work? Mary well, I, I, smiling very broadly, so I don't know if you wanted to jump in there. All right, so I was going to say personalization. So when we look at mm -hmm. how we personalize to each of our physicians, um, when we look at how we personalize our message to patients, uh, when we look at how we work with teams inside, how do we personalize? Because there's no one team that's the same within. Uh, so, you know, an example I always like to give is, as we know from the movie Finding Nemo, um, about that little orange fish, uh, she, he meets up with Dory. And Dory is a fish that kind of suffers from a little bit of memory loss. And every time uh, Nemo meets Dory, it's the same response. Well, that's kind of like what it feels like when we go to the website of a pharma company. It's the same response. So the HCP, whether they're interested in a, uh, they're getting an awareness ad, for instance, instead of an interested ad. So really knowing where they are in the journey and being able to start that conversation over and over again where they left, left off or being able to share that information that we just got from the website to the field force so they know where to have that best conversation. So personalization is really what we're missing out on. And then how do you connect their technology to be able to do that in a real-time manner? I see everyone nodding in agreement. Michael, what do you think? Yeah, I could not agree with that more. Um, yeah, treating everyone the same, this concept of broad brush, just it doesn't work anywhere. Right, um, and maybe through selling hamburger helper or something like that. But right, for what we do, if you think about it, you know, everyone's an end of one. And broadly speaking, over the past 10, 15 years, we've been working on segmentation, we've been working on data analysis, trying to get to people who look like this, right? Whether that's a provider, whether that's a patient, et cetera. Um, so everything that Mary said, I could not agree with more, right? So, you know, segmentation gives us data. Once we know data, we understand preferences, we understand who this person is then we can provide greater value to that person. And again, to tie it all together, you want a seamless experience that is data-driven so that we know how to serve that one individual. Do you think we'll ever get to N of one? Uh, yeah, I think we will. I, I think that it's, it's, I think it's a foregone conclusion at this point. I think, um, it, I was listening to one of the earlier sessions and this show sort of popped into my head. There's a great uh, William Gibson quote, right? The future is already here, so it's not very widely distributed, right? The ability to do this exists. Uh, the question is, is how do you scale that thing? And, and a lot of what we were talking about before, what Ahmed was talking about with, with technology, these technologies are in place today. The question is, is how do we scale them to reach such a vast audience? Okay, jumped off a little bit there, Kristen, but uh, we were talking about where technology might be able, be able to improve CX in the pharma space. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to steal Mary's Nemo story to tell other people when I have to give that example, because it's true. And I think, you know, it, over my history of, of time in digital marketing, I've been able to personalize messages at different levels, depending on what the capabilities are that support me, right? So it really is a back-end technology that needs to be um, um, improved or just continue to be driving so that we can deliver that that best experience. Because I I've done it in certain ways in different different times and dare I say 15 years ago. So I think I know it's possible. It's just how we apply it and how we can get it done. Um, you know, and the other thing too is what um, Ahmed said made me think. Also accepting things for what they are. So I think sometimes we try too hard to get computers to be people. Or, and I think if we just acknowledge that it's a computer, then we won't be frustrated or we won't be trying so hard to make it human. I think the humanization of it is a part of it just to make it relatable. But if people recognize that you're talking to a computer, then the experience should be understandable that it's not, you know, it's going to give me the right information. It doesn't have to look like me or um, or sound like me either. So I think it's just in how, you know, customer expectations, um, how we set them, and then how we, the information and usually the content is the more important information that they're looking for, not necessarily how it's served up. So, you know, being the website, that would be a similar thing. If I've seen an ad about a specific content, I'd like to go to the, the website and see that content sooner than later or try to dig for it. And so what's a good number then, Kristen, will create Six different HCP personas, maybe like, you know, like, you know, early adopters or, you know, laggards and right. then maybe three or four patient personas. And, and then that should be enough if we just tailor the marketing to those four segments. 
Well, I think that's what we're doing now, right? All of us do that. And I think, um, but the N of one is truly based on my experiences that bring me to wherever I've landed. So if we have the ability to capture that and use that data, then I think we will have more of a personalized experience for that customer, whoever it is. Um, it wouldn't be based on a persona. It would start there and it would dwindle down to more me because it's based on what I just did. And that's possible now. We just don't do it. <laughs> Ahmed, where can pharma improve in terms of CX and technology? Well, I think someone said it earlier, customers internally, customers externally, and then someone also said friction. And I have to say that I've worked with pharma for several years now, and pharma is a huge source of friction. <laughs> um, and so uh, a lot of the technology uh, challenges we're having today is, is because of ambiguity around the technology and the, the friction around its use and how to make it happen. And not all of the blame lays on pharma, of course, because a lot of those things are set by folks who work outside pharma and none of those people generally know the depth of the technology that they're, that they're regulating. And so, um, for example, N of one, N of one has a component of how much information you know about a person, but also the temporal nature. This, this is what's happening now. ACPs want to be treated like people. It's so ironic. We're all sharing our living rooms and studies and kids running in the back. We're finally people as we work. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? That's been the case with, with clinicians and HCPs in their practice. They're not just the doctor. They're also the person that has to think through and have opinions. So it's so shocking to me that when people approach them, a lot of the personal information around this person, what they thought, what they opined on, etc., is not available at their fingertips, even though it could be done. And that comes from that friction. There's a battle between being able to do it and treating people like people. So that's where the friction is. And I, I, I'm hoping that digital assistants um, also create uh, the first people, the first group of customers in pharma will be the sales strategy people, the marketing people using those assistants because they're finally, you know, dividing what's data and what's information in a safe regulated way and they're auditable unlike paper and other things that creates a pathway of balance between reducing the friction and getting closer to n of one i like uh i like the way you phrase that in terms of a pathway of imbalance we do have a uh, a question here and it's sort of appropriate for what you just said with regards to pharma, I was going to ask if, if pharma has a lot of friction because of the regulatory aspects of it, or perhaps the way that a particular disease state manis manifests itself uniquely within each patient, as we saw from Teddy and JJ's presentation with, with the breast cancer examples. But, you know, how do you improve this marketing experience when you have to use go through mlr and prb and approval teams and they're all siloed from not only the rest of the company and brands uh but also you know sort of from the company you know the company themselves they always operate in their own little world they do they do and i think this is where um uh Technology that is easily auditable, technology that is transparent, technology that people sign up for. I mean, have you looked at a consent form lately? It's not made <laughs> to be a friendly, a friendly, approachable tool for a patient signing up for a clinical trial, right? It's really made to, to mitigate issues, not made to enhance the, the knowledge of the person about the trial. Not all of them, I'm generalizing. But with technology, we can audit that we can measure how that consent form did. Then we can learn and we can change. So the, I think the operative word is technology is 100% auditable, 100% measurable, and can be made transparent. And with those things in place, I think it's a lot easier to, to, to eliminate the silos that you're talking about, Seth. So people are much more comfortable, you know, lower the bar for risk. Anyone else uh, have any thoughts on the regulatory nature and uh, siloed nature of the corporate structure? Let me add to that if I can, just because I've been in the space for so long. Um, so we are a risk averse industry um, by definition. We always have been. We, uh, we will be. Uh, we are a highly regulated industry. We are not a very well trusted industry by and large. Uh, you don't want to start a fight. You can either talk about politics or, or big pharma. Um, and 
so there's a couple things that I think exist by definition, right? Silos exist for a reason in pharma. It's not because we don't want to work well together. Uh, they exist for very real reasons, whether that's brand, whether that's technology, whether that's MLR. We, we, we cordon these things off for a reason. That does not mean that they can't work together. So that's a, this, this concept of workflow, as I meant to talk about a little bit about you know, how you use technology, again, back to friction, how you use technology to overcome those points. Because we have to have separation in areas does not mean that we can't communicate well. It does not mean that we can't move information well. It does not mean that we can't have a process that allows us to smoothly execute. Um, you know, it, it, you can go back go back to what Henry Ford did with cars, right? People used to do things one at a time, and he figured out a way to move things along. And there's really no reason why we can't do that. The difference is we do it now with data and information. So I think that there are technologies out there. I, I'm working with a company right now that figured out a way to build a content authoring tool to um, – to, to expedite and accelerate their ability to bring content to market faster in sort of an approved format. And, and that's the idea. So there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff out there. So Kristen, Mary, any, uh, I mean, you guys representing pharma, you could plead the fifth here if you wanted to. <laughs> uh, so, so but, Seth, I think there, there's a couple of, of areas here where this question is, it's how do you break down product design, right? So from a technology perspective, it's our job to make sure that that technology not only works for the customer, but it works internally. So they have an easier uh, way of use. So it's really goes back to when you think about good product design, it has good CX or customer experience, but you look at your internal customers and what they have to face from that MLR process, um, as well as what that external needs to do from not having the same conversation over and over again. So how well you use your digital asset management system, how well you set up that you know internal kind of uh, best in class is kind of all what goes into answering kind of a little bit of that question of what goes behind the scenes. Yeah, and I'll just, I mean, I'm seeing Diane's note and I have to agree with her. So I will, you know, voice that as well that I think the, I've brought a lot of new things through LMR um, over the years, and it's really just partnering with the teams and educating and education really first. And that takes a lot of time and it can be um, cumbersome or tiresome because you are bringing people up to where your brain already is, but it definitely um, takes that, that investment in that um, upfront can bring you much more success at the end of that review process and being able to get things through. So no matter what you're, what you're trying to achieve, having them help and understand the, that end, end goal, and then knowing that the technology, as you, like you guys were saying, safe and measurable and auditable and easily changed if we need to, and can, you know, doesn't have comments if we don't want it to, those kinds of concerns that are sometimes on um, regulatory and legal minds. And I think if we just address them up front, we can be pretty successful. So it also comes back to maybe a, a corporate structure thing and a uh, uh, cultural thing as well, making sure that that everyone is involved, but uh, sometimes regulatory is used as an, ex as an excuse. I'm going to move to a topic that's near and dear to my heart, which is chatbots. Uh, I hate them. Uh, Mary, what do you think about chatbots? So this goes back to that personalization, right? Because you know that the customer is coming to your website, they want some answers. So I think it's about how you set up the to respond and triage those questions in such a way that it's meaningful. So instead of sitting there and waiting for an operator to pick up the phone and actually do something, having it so it's really, really meaningful, whether it's requesting a rep to come visit, whether it's um, requesting a sample, whether it's getting a copay card, really setting it up and really knowing what that customer wants um, is really kind of some of the success behind a chatbot of what we've seen, but being able to share that data of what the chatbot just encountered and uh, went through and being able to send it to the right teams for that follow-up care that needs to happen afterwards um, and making it seamless, right? So there's frictionless behind that interaction that that customer just had. But they never, ever, 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 ever work. Michael, chatbots, love them or hate them? Uh, I, yes. Uh, yeah. yes. So, <laughs> You know, it, you, you, you love the idea that there's always someone there. Um, you love the idea that you can, in theory, get an answer to a question. They don't always necessarily work the way that we'd like them to work. They are not as seamless or as frictionless as we like. The reason you hate them is the same reason my wife screams at Siri, right? So when she asks for something, <laughs> you get something completely different, and you get frustrated because you're driving. And, you know, so that's the frustration we have. Why? Because we're not there yet, right? But we're getting there. 
And I think, you know, as we continue to get better at the technology, as we get to continue to get better to understand, as Mary just said, you know, it's great that we had the interaction, but then how do I make the insight from that interaction? How do I move that through the organization so that everybody can now act on it? How do you orchestrate that entire experience? Um, so, I mean, I guess I like them. Uh, I, they're frustrating experiences, but they're better than having no input. Ahmed, do you guys make uh, chatbots? No, we don't. Um, we don't make chatbots. <laughs> okay. And I would say, for, I, I, like anything, first generation chatbots have kind of the, the burden of the of the firstborn, if you will. And I come from a big family, and I was not, <laughs> so I uh, I heard it in in a loud earfuls from my older siblings about how hard it was. And I think chat if chatbots were to talk or chatbots of today were to have siblings in five years, they would say the same thing. You you couldn't believe how hated we were when we first came out. And now, you know, these chat chatbots, right. and the fundamental problem with today's chatbots is they are siloed. They don't have access to the things that would have made them useful. And so they're really just there, just like that consent form to put, you know, boundaries around things so you don't get to talk to the human. The purpose of the chatbot today works beautifully for what it's built for, which is not to give you the best experience. Um, it's so I need to lower my experience. expectations. For now. For, for, for now, now, right. But those chatbots will go from a cost center to a, a, a revenue center. And the way that's going to happen is people are going to measure them and say, wow, when we do these things in these chatbots, we get higher customer lifetime value. You know, this yep. HTTP or, or, or their team comes to us on a repeating basis. And that's when they start to become much more interested in what we're doing and being partnered with us. And then that chatbot is going to go from IT is managing it as a cost uh, uh, deterrent to Oh, some fancy new department that did the, the, the center of excellence of all chatbots at Pharma X now <laughs> owns this chatbot because it's learned how to become a customer lifetime value benefit tool. So the yeah, the the center of excellence for chatbots headed up by Kristen Winters. <laughs> I was just uh, gonna say, I'll do it. That'd be great. Oh, you're it. a recent convert <laughs> to uh, chatbots, uh, yeah. you know, as, as of last week, but. Uh, Anything really to share happen. with regard to that and your opening statement, you you certainly. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I think you you know that I have hope for the future, and I think I mean, I like the way you said it's the first the first porn who's paving the way because it really is. I think it's just it's the it's the the simple minimal viable product we have out right now. It's just got to go out and do this one thing, and and everyone's trying with the data that they have. So yes, my experience, Xfinity's dropping the ball, but Yahoo's getting it right. So, you know, things that it just depends on who you see um, start to get it right. I love the cost center aspect of it because yes, I should be able to drive a rep in to see the doctor who connected, right? Like the next day, it should be able to happen and be on that hot target that is, you know, very interested and they'll pull through a, a sale. So I think you see it, you'll see it more grow with people who can probably drive sales immediately. And you'll, and I'm sure we, I just don't know some of them probably, but I'm guessing some of the retailers sort of already do. You can upsell people on things immediately through a chat bot based on what I'm asking about. So I think, I think the, the technology, like we said, is there. It's just how we're using it and how we're feeding it back to give us more information to make us smarter. Okay. It'll get better. We are almost at the end of our time, so we'll go to the lightning round. Answer this in one word <laughs> or short phrase. We will reconvene in 2025, five years from now. And so by that time, what do you think, what tool or technology will be having the most impact five years from now? Ahmed? I don't think there's a single technology. Oh, my come word, on. My, <laughs> my, word, my, my final answer on that, the one word is agility. Kristen? Um, integration, I'll say, because that's kind of how I feel. It, it, we have to connect everybody. Michael, we're running out of buzzwords. What do you think? Orchestration. Oh, that's an old IQV idea, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, we don't need to bring that up. Mary? AI and virtual reality. All right. So, oh, virtual. Yeah. Well, we haven't talked much about virtual.